Well, thanks so much for taking the time to talk to us. Why don't you start out by telling everyone who you are and what your focus is on in the software. Yeah, sure. Um, my name is DJ Ramming. Uh, I think you know that. Uh, and uh, I work on the Flame Design team. I've been on the design team for about seven years now. I've been at Autodesk for coming on around 15 years. Uh, one of my focuses, actually my primary focus on the Flame side is the data management and media management. So these are a lot of the things that are kind of more related to infrastructure, media getting in and out, um, and uh, some of the tools that apply to that. So things like uh, SDKs, the Wiretap SDK, the OpenClip XML, um, a lot of the tools like Flame Archive and Flame Export. Uh, so that's kind More of the club. area. Yeah, the, the stuff that outside of the application, not necessarily the creative tools directly inside, you know, action or the timeline. It's all of the stuff that surrounds it. Okay, there is something though inside the uh, software that's new this time that will have a big impact on users, and I think that's uh, the on-demand proxies, which is pretty cool. Can you kind of work us through that and a bit of history? Yeah, sure. Proxies? I think that that's one of the things that uh, a lot of people have been asking for for a long time, was the ability to have um, what was called, I think it's been called numerous times, clip-based proxies, and the ability to have proxies just for one clip and not for an entire project. Um, going through it, we took a look at how the what the most efficient ways would be to implement it. And uh, there were a couple of things that we wanted to make sure we were able to nail. And so one was to have a workflow that was consistent with some of the other parts of the application. And so if we take a look at the way that we've done cache source media in recent releases, we have the ability for any clip to actually have a cache or not have a cache. And on demand, you can go ahead and cache a clip or release the cache for a clip. And you can do that for portions of a uh, project or for an, uh, you know, an entire desktop or an entire timeline. So when we were looking into implementing the uh, proxies workflow, we wanted to make sure that it was consistent with that. Mm -hmm. And so if we, first thing we'll take a look at is if you look in the Media Hub, right next to cache source media on import, we've also got the ability to generate proxies on import. So if I've got this enabled, that means that anything that I import will actually automatically get proxies generated for it. But I can disable it at any point, and I don't need to have it on all the time. The same is true for restoring archives, uh, uh, for capture from uh, videotape. Um, you've got the ability at any point to decide whether or not you want to generate proxies. Um, and so one of the things that we noticed was talking to clients about why proxies and on-demand was going to be such an important thing is that when proxies were really required at this point, it wasn't the beginning of the job. It was when things got really complicated at the end of the job, which was you know very long time after you've made that initial decision about your project. And settings. you have way more clips to generate proxies for. Uh, yeah, and you have you have a whole bunch of media, and you've got very little time to actually get right. things done. You can't just stop and wait for it to generate a whole bunch of proxies. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that we would only be able to target a select amount of clips to be able to generate proxies for. The other thing that's changed with the old version of proxies, so the previous implementation in Flame was kind of based on uh, an era where people's storage devices didn't necessarily keep up with right. the uh, deliverables that they need to have. So there would be a proxy workflow where you'd be able to play back real time the work you're working on and deliver at a higher resolution. It's been a while that that's no longer the case. Most of the time, the projects people are working on, their storage is plenty fast enough to be able to deliver it. So really where the most value comes is when setups are really complex. So the first thing that we were able to do was to say, even without proxies on disk, we've added a new proxy quality. And so this allows you to actually switch over to a lower resolution of the entire processing graph. So everything's being processed a lot lower resolution, but there's no need for proxies on disk. Right. And so this is a case where pulling the media off the disk is no longer the slowest link in the chain. It's the complexity of the processing that you're doing. So you basically full res off the disk, but you're changing the rendering resolution along the pipeline. Exactly, and, and you know the same way that you can see here that there's small adapters, it'll go ahead and adapt at any point um, to say, I need to process this at a lower resolution, or in certain exceptional circumstances, this is something that needs to be done at full resolution. So for this small portion of the pipeline, I'll switch back to full resolution and go back to proxy resolution. But again, this is with absolutely no proxies on disk, so you don't need to use up storage space, you don't have to wait to generate that. Um, if the real challenge and the slowest link in the chain is just the processing. Um, that being said, and although we don't have it in this specific setup, if we've got something that's actually pulling a lot of media, so you've pulled in a whole bunch of CG renders from slow storage, and you've got a setup that maybe isn't necessarily all that complex, but what's really taking time is the source media getting pulled off of disk. One of the things you can do is just go ahead and say, let me go ahead and just for this single batch setup, generate me source proxies. So this will go through and generate proxies on disk for all of the sources in this batch setup. The same is true at the timeline level, the same is true at a, the entire desktop level or any real group. You're able to say, for this, I need to actually have proxies on disk as well because I want to have better performance pulling off of disk. 
Okay, so that's something that's readily apparent to users, I think, when interacting with the software. But you're really working on or helping build what I would like to call the Flame API. Uh, maybe not, that's not what it's called, but actually this idea of working with other applications or actually the ability to allow people to write their own custom Python scripts and have them accessible within, either within the software or externally to the software. I think that's an interesting thing. I think it's an interesting thing that you call it the Flame API because a lot of people have started calling this consolidated set of tools that we're providing the same thing. Even though it's not a single API, we've started adding things like the Python hook workflow, uh, like Flame Archive and Flame Export, um, like Wiretap, obviously, the kind of larger SD API that we've got for plugging into our media management. And um, most recently, I think the thing that people have uh, certainly been talking to me a lot about is the open clip XML workflows that allow for um, you know, multi-version clips outside of Flame, being able to generate those and kind of inject Flame, um, inject versions directly into a Flame timeline. I think combined with uh, what you probably talked to Stefan about, the connected conform workflow, mm -hmm. you now have the ability to take that shot sequence and generate out a whole bunch of open clip XML files from that shot sequence that will then ripple through automatically with no additional um, kind of manipulation into all of your different deliverables. And so we started to see people taking that um, open clip XML workflow combined with the Python hook export workflow that we added in uh, 2015 extension 2 and start to leverage that to build their own export kind of automation processes. Uh, one of the things we saw that was kind of a very successful leveraging of that was the shotgun flame integration mm -hmm. that was able to go ahead and take the work that was done in flame to build a Python environment and a specific workflow around export and allow that to plug into creating right. shots inside Shotgun, um, kind of looping back with the open clip XML, um, using third-party applications to render versions directly into Flame. Um, but as we started doing that, uh, a whole bunch more people started realizing, oh, this Python environment inside Flame actually can do stuff. And so we started getting requests, people started testing things out, um, implementing their own automated workflows using the hooks. Um, but one of the things that came back was, we'd really like to have a workflow that is nothing. So just give me the ability to inject some of my own um, tools directly inside the Flame interface. And so what we did for 2016 extension one was to go ahead and implement a generic custom UI hook. And so this allows you to go ahead and add entries into the contextual menu in Flame that does just about anything. So here I've got you know, a web utilities section that would go ahead and launch a couple of web pages. These could also be internal web pages. Um, but one of the things that's kind of exciting about this, or one of the things that's useful about this, is that uh, we also send out the wiretap node IDs for anything that's in the selection that the user selected. And so this means that I could select this reel, for example, or this batch setup, and be able to say, send these clips to an archive. I could select an entire desktop or a library, and in this example, what I've used is I've used the hook to go ahead and fire off a back burner job and start Flame Archive with the selection that I just um, selected inside Flame. And so this is firing off and adding all of these clips to an archive that just the way that we'd configured this specific script is the name of the project that I'm working on in my default archive directory. Uh, so if you take a look at the contextual UI there, you have two things on there, web utilities and custom utilities, but those are things that you have defined via a Python script, correct? Yeah, actually this entire last section is just um, entries that I've added in myself here. These were obviously just for examples, and so we were kind of walking through a number of different people, uh, walking through what could be done with the custom UI hooks, and so we added some things that might be interesting. Uh, you know, obviously I've just shown the uh, sending, archives, uh, sending clips to archive, but there's also you know, the ability to get the available metadata. What this does is leverages another portion of, I guess, what you were calling the Flame API, the Wiretap API, to go ahead and pull from this clip um, a timeline that's an EDL or the metadata of all of the information inside the source and dump it into the shell. Obviously, that's not very useful, um, but it could explain, it could kind of provide an idea of what could, that could be used for. And so that could be used to send information to a tracking tool or to be able to copy and paste something or email someone something specific about this clip. Well, I think it's actually really promising. Of course, under web utilities, we were joking earlier, you could have a launch FX guide or launch the Facebook logic page. Those are big, two good additions, I think, to the web yeah. utilities. I, I, I'm a little worried about sending the launch Facebook one with the Fair amount enough. of traffic that's already on there. But Fair enough. Well, hey, thanks so much for taking the time to walk us through it. Really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thanks again.